he walked this earth like a colossus. Brought down the mightiest empire on earth without firing a single bullet. And led half a billion people to freedom. No wonder India worshipped him and still worships him as the Mahatma, which means the great soul. But 150 years after the birth of India's greatest political icon on 2nd October 1869, how will the nation remember him? The fact that the ruling political party somehow seems to think that Hindus are first-class citizens and Muslims and Christians are second-class citizens would have worried and upset him. His vision for independent India was also as simple as uh, all his other, uh, his philosophy was. And that was for the liberation of the poorest of the poor. Are Gandhi's ideas still relevant for 21st century India? Or has the country completely abandoned his teachings and ideas? Modern India, home to 1.3 billion people. A nation that's incredibly rich in culture and steeped in tradition. A dynamic economy that is the world's sixth largest by nominal GDP. He's visible at every turn. His face is on the Indian currency, the rupee. There are statues of him across the country and every major city has a road named after him. In other words, Gandhi occupies a special place in the heart and soul of the nation and is widely regarded as the father of the nation. Gandhi was born on October 2nd, 1869 in the port city of Porbandar, Gujarat in the northwest of India. His father was the chief minister of Porbandar. His mother was a devout Hindu. His parents were both very religious. Uh, there were a lot of uh, visitors who used to come to his home when he was very young to discuss religious texts, discourses, etc. And his father had Muslim friends, uh, um, you know, non-Hindu friends, essentially. And so uh, uh, Gandhi, I think, imbibed uh, a lot about you know, not just religious texts, but the idea of religious tolerance, pluralism, from a very young age. Though he was living in the religious family, Gandhi was a little bit of a rebel. Oh, as a young man, he is like any other young man. He has moral dilemmas. He experiments with cheating. He eats meat secretly as an experiment, even though that is an absolute anathema in his family. And, uh, and he repents. He regrets. He deals with that. So he knowingly commits a moral transgression, but then he kind of climbs his way back from that. At the age of 19, Gandhi set sail for England and tried his hand at becoming a typical English gentleman. Gandhi does talk a lot about his time in London. Initially, he tries to be an English gentleman, you know, copy the British. Uh, so, you know, he buys these expensive suits, a watch, he even takes dancing lessons, etc. But quite quickly he realizes that that's not the life for him. And he also realizes that his family, and particularly his brother, had actually forsaken, sacrificed a lot to send him to London. And he realizes that you know, he was doing an injustice to, to, to his family. So he quickly then reverts back to a life of simplicity. In fact, he mentions that he then stops taking public transport. He walks wherever he needs to go to. At the age of 22, Gandhi was called to the bar. And after a brief time practicing law back in India, he took a job in South Africa which was also part of the British colony back then. 
it was here that Gandhi had some appalling encounters with racism. As an Indian immigrant, he was shocked by the blatant discrimination against the colored people in the country. And this particular incident happens during a train ride and Gandhi had a first class ticket and he was uh, sitting in the first class compartment. The ticket collector comes in and then says, you know, that Gandhi is, uh, because he's not a white, he's not entitled to sit in the first class compartment, even though he has a first class ticket. And he, Gandhi protests and he's subsequently thrown off the, the train with his, with his baggage. That incident was one of many examples of discrimination against the colored people in South Africa. Gandhi went on to take up the fight against racial oppression and spent 21 years as a political campaigner in South Africa. When he returned to India 21 years later, he set out on a train journey to get to know his country again. Gandhi found a nation greatly divided along caste, cultural and linguistic lines. But he was undeterred in his mission to unify India. He travelled relentlessly across India. He was very good at cultivating a cadre of associates and colleagues and lieutenants. And of course, his own lifestyle, which was so transparent, so simple, one of sacrifice and commitment, appealed to people. Clothing was another factor that increased Gandhi's appeal in the eyes of the Indian masses. It was in 1913 that Gandhi actually first experiments. He, he gives up his sort of Western you know, suit, etc., that he used to wear uh, in courts as a lawyer. And for the first time wears Indian clothes. And he also shaves his head for the first time. One of the reasons why he does adopt the loincloth and, you know, and, and the bare body is really to identify with the masses, because again, in a large part of India was impoverished and most of them were poor, could not afford clothes. So the principal reason was uh, to identify with the impoverished masses. But how was Gandhi able to turn India's homemade fabric into a potent symbol of change and resistance against the British? Clothes, the traditional wear of the Indians, are dizzying in its array of colours and designs. Beyond its aesthetic beauty, clothes was also, for Gandhi, an important political tool, a means to achieve economic liberation for his people. What the British were doing, they were taking the cotton from India at, at very cheap prices, then taking it back to England, and then it was fueling the, the mills. Uh, textile mills. The textiles were produced in the mills in, in England were then uh, brought back to India and sold at, at very cheap prices. What happened was not only were the peasants being impoverished, uh, Indian handicrafts, uh, India's sort of cottage small industry was also completely destroyed. A flood of cheap English-made fabric, even cheaper than the ones provided by poorly paid Indian artisans had destroyed the livelihoods of many weavers. And as a response to this, Gandhi inaugurated the homespun cotton spinning as a way of inspiring Indians to become economically self-reliant. Gandhi was very focused on the dignity of labour. He believed that every individual must do some physical labour at some time during the day. Uh, and in his ashram, for example, the cooking and cleaning was done by himself and by his colleagues. In 1924, Gandhi assumed the leadership of a nationalist movement known as the Indian National Congress. Under his stewardship, the party was transformed from an elitist organization into a mass movement. Before that, the Indian National Congress was really an organization or a body of elites. What Gandhi does for the first time is make Congress into a mass organization, and that really is the 1919-1920 period when Gandhi begins what was then called the non-corporation movement where Gandhi and his followers boycott not only British goods 
but then they stopped going to schools, stopped going to work, uh, and, and then, in, in a sense, the entire British India is brought to a halt. Gandhi led nationwide campaigns to fight for political independence from British rule. He also introduced Satyagraha, or non-violent political resistance against the colonizers. Gandhi himself did not like the word passive resistance to be used for non-violence. He, fe he felt that there was nothing passive about non-violence. In fact, he felt that non-violence, Satyagraha, was in fact quite active. There was nothing passive in that. And that was, I think, in, in many ways, the genius of Gandhi. Without doubt, Gandhi was one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century. He took a large, diverse, divided, desperately poor colony and made it an independent nation. And he did it through using non-violence and dialogue, not through the force of arms. Unlike, for example, other countries, you know, Vietnam, which opposed French colonial rule through the gun. Indonesia, which opposed colonial rule through the gun. And in doing so, caused a lot of violence, including on their own people. So I think that was one of Gandhi's greatest achievements. Guard myself as a soldier, so a soldier of peace. One example of Satyagraha was the infamous Salt March. The act was simple. Gandhi was to march to the coast, boil seawater, and make salt. But the move turned out to be loaded with powerful symbolic significance. The British had a salt tax on the people. Indians were not allowed to make their own salt. The Salt March was an act of defiance, a non-violent political resistance against a law he saw as immoral. Gandhi set off from uh, his, his ashram with 78 odd followers. And uh, over the course of 24 days, eventually thousands of people joined Gandhi on, on, on the Salt March. This mobilized and generated immense enthusiasm uh, amongst the, the, the nationalist forces in India. And by the time Gandhi was done with producing the salt, um, I think roughly around 80,000 people had been jailed by the British. In fact, to the extent that there was no place left in, in prisons for Indian protesters. Unarmed civilians were beaten by the colonial police over the act of making salt. Jails were crowded with salt makers. By the time the Salt March was over, Britain had suffered a severe blow to its moral authority, just as Gandhi had hoped. The Salt March also made Gandhi a global figure, as the event was widely covered by press in the US, England and other colonies. In the same year, Gandhi was named the Man of the Year by Time magazine. Mahatma Gandhi was a saintly figure who was also a very shrewd politician, an unusual combination. He had a lot to do with both the strategy of non-violent opposition to the British and many of the tactical decisions made to pursue it. In 1947, after World War II, England was prepared to exit the colony. Gandhi's work of nearly three decades was coming to fruition. Independence at long last. But Muslim and Hindu leaders had different views about what an independent India would look like. the Indian National Congress rally with Gandhi's message of peace. But there are some who oppose it. Gandhi's speeches use Hindu language. You know, the chanting, the meditating, this is all very Hindu. It wasn't, it wasn't something that a Muslim would, would necessarily identify with. While Congress is open to Muslims, you have to remember that its membership was predominantly Hindu, and the leadership was predominantly Hindu. So even if they personally weren't biased or bigoted in any way, Muslims uh, didn't necessarily feel at home in, in, in the Congress. There are 20 million Muslims in British India, making up 5% of the population. 
they are politically represented by the Muslim League, headed by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, himself a former leader within the Indian National Congress. Freedom must mean freedom both from the British exploitation and Hindu domination. Millions of Muslims will never agree merely to a change of masters. Gandhi tried to persuade Jinnah to keep India together, but he failed. Gandhi made a fairly radical proposal. He in fact proposed that once India becomes independent, Jinnah should become the Prime Minister of India rather than Nehru. But this was an idea that did not go down very well with, with the likes of, of Nehru. Gandhi tried in, in various ways, but I think he was unable to convince not just Jinnah, but also eventually Congress leaders like Nehru that the partition was a bad idea. In fact, he was quoted as saying, you know, um, you know partition was, was, was a blow to all that he believed in. One India is impossible realization. It will inevitably mean that the Muslim will be transferred from the domination of the British to the caste Hindu. 16th August 1946. Gina calls for a direct action day. All upon all the leaders of the nation and the demand of general to organize our people. Jinnah used this interesting phrase. He, he said, I too have a revolver and we're now going to use it. What he was calling for was a show of strength. He wanted to show the British that the Muslim League had power on the streets all across the country. In the city of Calcutta, in the east of the country, the direct action day turns violent. The Muslims demonstrating their direct action, particularly in the city of Calcutta and to a lesser degree elsewhere, decided to show their direct action not just by marching, but by hitting, uh, by, by stabbing, by shooting. And as a result, hundreds of people were killed. This started in Calcutta, but then it started spreading. It went to Eastern Bengal, it went to UP, it spread to Punjab eventually. And in each of these places where you had violence, the communities that had once lived together and would live across the same street from one another uh, began to disintegrate and began to, to split apart. By the end of 1946, more than 30,000 people lost their lives to communal riots. So if you were a Hindu family in a Muslim neighborhood or a Muslim family in a Hindu neighborhood, you were an easy target. And so your house was burned down, you were killed, and so on. So what people did is they would divide and they would all move to neighborhoods where they're surrounded only by people from their community. And then they would literally put up barricades and post guards outside to protect themselves from the street violence. Gandhi was going from place to place, village to village, and um, trying to, to convince people to stop bloodshed, to, to give up their arms. In fact, uh, the last Viceroy of India, uh, Lord Mountbatten, called him a one-man army against the, 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 the violent forces at the time. Gandhi was soon proven to be victorious in his campaign for independence, but he will also suffer his greatest disappointment. Mahatma Gandhi had spent decades fighting for India's independence. In 1947, as many in the newly formed nation rejoiced, Gandhi did not celebrate with them. Indian freedom did not come with Indian unity. India was divided into two separate nations, Hindu-majority India and Muslim-majority Pakistan. The partition was the darkest era for Indians, marked by murderous violence. This is the gun which was responsible for much of the massacre. They were not fighting. They were just killing people with this movement putting this right across a person's mid part of the body. And children were killed with this. It was this part of the gun which was being used. Tahir Malik is a sociologist who collects artifacts from the time of partition. 
I had this passion to understand our cultural values. That's where I, you know, started collecting newspapers, articles, photographs, especially for the time period of 1940 to 1947. Now, here is a large collection of photographs, but I'm sharing few of them. Here you can see number of children, both male and female, which were killed. Some have starved, but mostly were stab wounds. The bodies were lying all over the place. It disturbs me a lot. Nobody could imagine that they will be leaving their houses and their houses will be burned, their women will be raped and their children will be killed. When political leaders can decide the future of a new nation, they can also decide how this process would take place. Why was this not planned? Why was not security provided to all the people? Why was this one of the biggest massacres of Asia. When India becomes independent in, in 1947, Gandhi by then is a very disillusioned man. He's because partition was something that he did not believe in. So ironically, on Independence Day, when you know the, the British flag, the Union Jack is lowered, the Indian flag, the tricolor is raised for the first time, Gandhi is not in Delhi, not part of the celebrations. In fact, he's in Bengal trying to quell the violence and the bloodshed. The independence that India attained was not the independence that Gandhi wanted. Hindustan is a Bhogon state, and in many years, we have been in Hindustan. So, how is it Hindustan? I can't do my own work. Gandhi was born in Fasi in the Gandhi started fasting in a bid to stop the violence. It worked in some cities, but in others, the horrific massacre goes unabated. Trains were going back and forth carrying refugees. They were attacked and, and people within them were, were killed and, and you know, they showed up on the other side of the border and they would show up dripping blood and, and with, with carriages full of corpses. There's one story of a girl on a, on a train platform who was crying on top of a pile of bodies and, and somebody came and gave her some gasoline to drink and then set her on fire. Gandhi was extremely distraught by partition. I mean, he had fought against this for years. He called it a vivisection of, of uh, Mother India. You know, he felt it was a wound, an amputation. Some of Gandhi's supporters, however, felt he was too compassionate to the Muslims. On 30th January 1948, while he was going for his daily multi-faith meetings, Gandhi was shot three times at point blank by Nadrum Gotsi who was a Hindu fundamentalist. In fact, when Gandhi gets assassinated uh, in January 30, 1948, not too long after independence, he was actually planning a trip to Pakistan. Gandhi felt that he, uh, he and India needed to reach out to Pakistan. And so he was preparing for that when he gets assassinated. During the, the trial, uh, Gotse gave uh, some of the reasons for killing Gandhi. And one of the reasons he gave for uh, killing Gandhi was that he, he and many of his ilk believed that Gandhi was too soft on Muslims. He felt that he had done a service to India by, by removing uh, someone that he felt was, was poor Pakistan, soft on Pakistan. Thousands thronged the streets of Delhi to mourn Gandhi. Nehru, then Prime Minister, said at the funeral that with Gandhi gone, the light 
had gone out of our lives. This martyrdom actually shocked Hindus. It made them uh, recognize the horror of what they've done. And they came together, and it really is martyrdom in some ways that rescued India and took it forward. Uh, ordinary Indians, and particularly the political leadership of the time, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and Deputy Prime Minister Vallabhai Patel, committed India to a democratic and plural constitutional order. When he was alive, Gandhi declared that all religions deserve equal respect. His morning sessions of public prayers were particularly significant. He began the day with recitations from the Quran, the Bible, and Hindu texts. Doing this was an exceptional way for Gandhi to demonstrate that all paths lead to the same God. Gandhi's understanding of religion, his experience of religion, is really much closer to what people are today calling spirituality. Now, mind you, he is a practicing Hindu. He fasts, he on a daily basis recites one entire chapter of the Gita. He knew it by heart. But this gives him such an openness, such an uh, expansive sense of uh, discovery of the divine experience in all its forms that he goes into great detail to understand Christianity, to understand Islam. The growing trends towards a kind of Hindu majoritarianism in Indian politics, the fact that the ruling political party somehow seems to think that Hindus are first-class citizens and Muslims and Christians are second-class citizens would have worried and upset him because he was absolutely committed to make the, making this a country in which religious distinctions did not matter in public life, in private, yes. You know, you could do what you wanted in the safety of your home. But he was did not want to make India a Hindu version of Pakistan. Gandhi gave his life to maintaining religious harmony. But today, more than 70 years after his death, Muslim-Hindu relations continue to threaten the peace. This place in Ayodhya is at the heart of that religious conflict. In 1989, a campaign was started to construct a Ram temple in Ayodhya in the north of India. This brought together a large number of believers all across the country. It was by no means representing the majority of Hindu public opinion, but still large enough to provoke a series of communal riots. The main victims were Muslims. 6th December 1992 will be remembered as a black day in Indian history. On that day, Hindu mobs stormed into the 16th century Babri Mosque built on the orders of the first Mughal emperor. They razed the mosque to the ground. The destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya was just the beginning. All over India, mobs ran amok and several hundred people were killed. Demands to build a new Hindu temple on the site of the mosque were spearheaded by the BJP, energizing the party's rise to power. BJP leader Narendra Modi became the prime minister in 2014. Since Modi's rise to power, emboldened right-wingers, supported by his conservative party, have made their presence felt in radical ways. In the past two years, there have been selective bans on films that are deemed to be sacrilegious. On eating beef because cows are sacred in Hinduism. And there has also been a sharp increase in hate crimes against Muslims in India. Under Modi, incidents of communal violence rose 28% between 2014 and 2017. The great-grandson of Mahatma Gandhi believes that his Bapu would not have approved this ugly turn of events. The nature of the fundamentalist streak that is now dominant and very evident in our society is alien to Hinduism. The purest form of Hinduism was a liberal way of life. And that is where Bapu used to always take pride in describing himself as a fundamental Hindu as a Sanatani Hindu. 
is what the term that he used, which means that they live by the purest tenet of Hinduism. On the question of how Gandhi would have reacted to uh, Hindu nationalist forces, I think very negatively, because Gandhi in his time was all for tolerance, pluralism, and uh, even though he had you know, contacts with Hindu nationalists, he, he never got along with them. In fact, Gandhi was assassinated by someone who was deeply imbued in Hindu nationalist thinking. So Gandhi, even though he himself was a believing Hindu, Gandhi would have not at all been you know, enamored by uh, uh, in the intolerance that we, we often see um, in, in India currently. During his lifetime, Gandhi also spoke out against child marriage, violence against women, the dowry system, and lack of schooling for women. But all these remain embedded in daily life, despite flickers of progress. The crimes against women persist in a shocking manner. These crimes were happening uh, even in the past. They get highlighted now. I'm not saying that uh, they're any less horrifying. But the fact is that even when these crimes occur, you hear voices that in a way blame the women for their fate. If women were to be free, they had to be fearless. This was the message that Gandhi gave to India's women. He involved them in the struggle against colonialism and consistently told the women that bravery and courage were not the monopoly of men. Gandhi, in the course of the nationalist movement, brought in many more women. Many of the movements that Gandhi led actually had plenty of women taking part. So even if you see visuals of demonstrations, visuals of meetings. Even the spinning movement, the hand-spinning movement, had a lot of women who were involved. But more than seven decades after his death, women empowerment continues to be a problem in India. India's women are angry over the numerous incidents of rape. So, taking cue from Gandhi's message on bravery, they've decided to take matters into their own hands. In a slum village on the outskirts of Lucknow, 26-year-old teacher Usha Vishwakarma is teaching her Red Brigade gang how to take down male assailants. In India, there have been many cases where women have been raped, abused and murdered. Only rarely are the perpetrators brought to justice. For Gandhi, who was a supporter of women's rights, this aspect of India would surely have been greeted with a disappointment. Police Prashasan, I mean, they took the word of the word. They didn't do anything to us. Today, we will do our own self-defense. A 11-year-old child was raped, who I was studying. And that rape was not done by his father, who was 35 years old. And he was raped for a year and a year. And after a year, he was raped. मेरे साथ ये घटना हुई मेरे साथ जो पढ़ाता था उसने मेरे ऊपर अटेम्प्ट टू रेप का प्रयास हुआ जिससे मैं मेंटली डिस्टर्ब एक साल तक रेकॉग्नाइजिंग द वायलेंस वुमेन फेस्ड इवन बैक देन गांधी आर्ग्यूड फॉर चेंज इन मेल एटीट्यूड्स दैट मेन शुड कंसीडर ऑल वुमेन एस इफ दे वर देयर मदर्स और डॉटर्स बट एक्शन स्पीक लाउडर देन वर्ड्स एंड टुडे Feminists in India argue that Gandhi did not do enough to alter their cause. Women should be present in the public sphere, they should not be confined in their homes. So in that sense, he's talking about women's rights, but I don't think he pushes it in a sort of radical manner in which you know, later scholars and feminists would have liked him to. So I think there is a, a, a definite split amongst you know, scholars who's, who study sort of gender, gender relations, 
and Gandhi did not probably do enough on this score. Gandhi pushed for greater equality for women. Alongside greater equality for people of different castes, he fought for the rights of the Dalits, who were deemed untouchable in India's caste system. He argued to the 1920s that a free India must be based on a non-violent or democratic politics, must promote religious harmony, must abolish caste and gender distinctions, and must sustain economic self-reliance. But shocking atrocities against Dalits still exist in parts of India. Gandhi's home state of Gujarat has one of the highest incidences. A Dalit man was allegedly lynched by members of upper caste Patel community for watching people do the garba, the traditional Gujarati dance. In another incident, a Dalit man was beaten up in Gandhi Nagar district by upper caste Rajputs for sporting a moustache. More than 1,300 atrocities against Dalits were reported in Gujarat alone in 2016. This would have deeply saddened Gandhi, who dreamt of a classless and casteless society. Bapu's idea of caste was of assimilation. He wanted a Hindu society to assimilate in a kind of a statusless uh, kind of uh, society where there were no hierarchies. Another issue where Gandhi demonstrated his foresight was the environment. Gandhi was special in anticipating the environmental crisis of today. You know, he was an early environmentalist. He warned that if India blindly imitated the Western model of industrialization, it would, in his words, strip the world bare like locusts. Because if China and India together tried to go to the levels of the West with the kind of energy consumption, the earth would simply be set on fire. But despite Gandhi's warnings, today's modern India has moved towards a highly consumerist society. Cities are lined with malls, a burgeoning middle class, estimated at 260 million, have immense buying power. In the last 20 years, the number of billionaires have increased by 1 to 55. The uncontrolled rise of the wealthy and social inequalities was Gandhi's biggest concern. So Gandhi's essential argument was accepting a lower level of economic standard by all. This is what he would call voluntary poverty. In a system of voluntary poverty, the distribution is more even. Perhaps this system is more idealistic than practical. 70% of India's people live in villages, and yet rural India is still backward. This has caused more and more people to migrate to cities in an attempt to climb out of poverty and debt. I think if Bapu was there, he wouldn't have allowed the things to slide so far, the disparities to become so vivid and uh, stark. Uh, but he would have uh, launched another movement to liberate the rural India from its passive acceptance of its fate. However, all is not lost. Gandhi still inspires young Indians. In Bengaluru, a group of young people have been inspired to initiate a cultural centre called Ragi Khana. Weekly markets held on Sundays to connect urban buyers to rural producers. Ragi Khana started with the thought of people who are migrating from villages to city, leaving their actual jobs which they are expertise in and coming to city and doing a menial jobs to avoid that what we thought was we'll provide a marketplace where villagers can still do their jobs what they were earlier doing and we'll provide a marketplace for them the philosophy behind this is very much gandhian where gandhi believed in the rural upliftment the gram swaraj where the villagers will produce their products and control the village economy 
all over India, there are also schools inspired by Gandhi's teachings. In Gujarat Vidyapath, a school founded by Gandhi in 1920, young students are taught a curriculum designed by Gandhi himself. At present, uh, we are different from other universities in, in many ways. They will get an education of three H. So first H is the hand, then second is the heart, and third is the head. Normally in all institutes, we are taking care of the head educations, not hand educations, and I think nowhere heart educations people will think on. Prescribed for the head are the normal curriculum that every other school in India undertakes. It is in the hand and heart education where the Gandhian school is remarkably different. Hand educations, uh, we made it a uh, programs like that. For morning, they will clean the whole campus. Then uh, they have to work at least one hour in a day for some production work. We are asking them to farm also. Uh, they have a, how to prepare a good compost, how to preserve the water, that all different kind of the things. Of course, nowadays we have a problem of a mosquitoes. So how to control the mosquito, that is also one kind of the production system. When it comes to the heart, the understanding of compassion is a must at this school. In heart education, we have some programs where uh, all students will go in the village area. They stay with the villagers and whatever the activities took place in the village, they will try to understand. Actually, literate people normally go in a village area to teach something to the villagers. But here our motto is different. We are asking students, don't teach anything to the villagers, but learn from the villagers because they have uh, ample knowledge traditional knowledge, traditional, uh, traditional tra traditions were there. From that, you can get a lot of things. During Gandhi's time, many students of this school went on to become leaders in the nationalist movement. Today, the school says that many of their students go on to work in civil society organizations and also in government. And these are sectors where Gandhian values will really make a difference. 150 years after his birth, Gandhi continues to inspire the young, give hope to the poor, and empower some of those in the women's movement. His ideas also resonate around the world. The civil rights movement in North America which really took shape in the 50s and 60s under the leadership of Martin Luther King, was based totally on Gandhian methods. Even where violence was used, uh, it could be eschewed. That's what happened in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was also a true follower of Gandhi in that once he was freed and once a democratic transition was underway in South Africa, he reached out to the white rulers through a message of reconciliation and dialogue. At a United Nations event on the 24th of September, world leaders gathered to commemorate Gandhi's 150th birth anniversary. Gandhi's ideas and ideals have resonated and endured. Gandhi also firmly believed in the intrinsic equality of every person. And this value resonates with Singapore because our nation was founded on the same principle. We became independent in 1965 because we wanted to be a country where everyone was treated equally, regardless of their race, language, or religion. And we continue to uphold that fundamental ideal. Gandhi's ideas had influence far beyond India's shores. Tensions and conflicts are prevalent, not just between countries, races, and religions, but also within them. But if we take Gandhi's message to heart, then we must try our best to resolve differences calmly and peacefully, appreciating the views of the other side and without inflaming passions or hardening attitudes. Gandhi is used by a lot of, you know, 
protest movements, forces who are fighting against the state. So in a sense, the Indian environmental movement that has protested against big dams, um, against development, you know, against grabbing of land of peasants. These are the movements that I think are inspired by Gandhi to protest against the state in a non-violent manner. That's, I think, one of the ideas that uh, still remains in India. His vision for independent India was also as simple as uh, all his other, uh, uh, his philosophy was. And that was for the liberation of the poorest of the poor, the uneducated, the deprived, the forsaken uh, people of India, and to make them uh, self-reliant for their own welfare.